Good morning, uh, everybody, and uh, both to the people here in person in the room and uh, online. Thank you so much for uh, joining us for this uh, very important event. Uh, it is really my great pleasure to have uh, Professor Kevin uh, Urama, who is uh, currently uh, acting chief economist for the African Development Bank and vice president, uh, to join us for a distinguished uh, panel of discussants on uh, this uh, very important issue uh, of uh, climate change and how it, it, it interacts with Africa's economic outlook. Uh, we're also joined by Mr. Simpasa uh, uh, from the AFDB uh, online. Uh, today, uh, as you saw in the teaser video, uh, Professor Rama will be presenting the AFDB's uh, African Economic Outlook, which spotlights the importance of supporting climate resilience and a just energy transition in Africa. Uh, I think, you know, uh, if any of you have had a chance to look at the New York Times over the weekend, uh, this point about Africa's development challenge and the issue of climate change were brought into sharp relief on, uh, on uh, ongoing exploration, explorations, I should say, uh, of four gas uh, in, in uh, the DRC at the moment. Um, you know, the minister for DRC is quoted as saying kind of that, uh, you know, the implications of DRC going forward with uh, exploiting uh, the significant gas resources it has in the Viranga National Forest uh, are something that have to be advanced despite the potential implications for climate change. And this is because, you know, our African policymakers face the unenviable task of needing to uh, invest trillions of dollars in uh, important energy supply that the region needs to advance its developments, while at the same time we're being asked to uh, think about the adverse implications that this may have for climate change when uh, advanced countries who benefited from uh, climate you know, unfriendly policies are unwilling to support development in our region. So this is one of the big issues that policymakers certainly raise to us uh, when we engage with them uh, on the financing challenge they face. And today, uh, I'm ho hoping that Kevin's presentation will touch on uh, some of these issues, as well as the broader economic outlook for uh, the African continent. The report is quite sobering. Uh, I had a chance to uh, skim through it uh, over the weekend and really raises some profound uh, issues. Um, so look forward, Kevin, to your presentation and uh, interventions by, uh, by Mr. Simpasa. Uh, as discussants on the fund side, we have uh, James Rofe uh, from Fiscal Affairs Department, who of course spearheads quite a lot of our work on, on climate uh, transition issues and uh, Cathy Patillo uh, in AFR, who also thinks through these issues for us, um, will be moderating the event and, uh, and uh, is co-hosting with me the event. So with that, uh, Kevin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, my brother, Abebe, for that introduction to this subject. Um, can you put on the slides, please? I would like to use this opportunity to actually thank the IMF for giving us the platform to share this uh, outlook of the Africa's economies uh, and the interactions between trying to grow the economies in a sustainable way while also trying to meet the energy needs of the continent and address the climate resilience challenges that the world faces. So uh, in my presentation, I'm going to be focusing on three aspects. First is just to paint a picture of the Africa's economic outlook. So the report is structured in three chapters. One, Africa's economic performance and outlook. The second on the issues of climate resilience and just energy transitions in Africa. And then the third one, looking at a critical issue which we all grapple with all the time, in terms of financing, uh, where is the financing going to come for supporting this climate resilience and just energy transitions in Africa? And draw a few policy recommendations at various levels. One, at the, what African governments need to do and need to do more of, but also what we as multilateral development banks and development agencies need to do to support them and what the global community can also do. So running very fast on the uh, 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 growth performance and outlook of the continent, because speaking at the IMF, 
This is something that you also do very well on, so I'm not going to stress that quite a lot. But we know we had a contraction in 2020, up to 1.9% by our estimates, but the economies for the region rebound to about 6.9% uh, in 2021. Well, because of the multiple challenges, I mean, the geo, uh, global tensions, like the where Russia, uh, war in Russia, uh, sorry, Russia's war in Ukraine, and also increasing uh, costs of adapting to climate change. And while still trying to recover from COVID-19, we see that's going to be some slowdown uh, in 2021 and 20, um, in 2022 and 2023, respectively. But as usual, Africa is a very heterogeneous continent and the patterns of growth and the drivers of this growth and also the headwinds that the different countries face are really very different. So it's often very difficult to discuss Africa in terms of averages, um, like I've done in the first uh, slide. So if you look at this slide, you find that different regions have recovered differently and the, the, the uh, projections for the different regions are also very different. If I start from South Africa, I saw about 6% contraction in 2020 because of COVID. We have seen a very impressive recovery uh, to up to 4.2% because of several policy uh, responses by these countries, which I know um, that IMF has worked with them quite a lot on, so I'm not going to rehash on all of them. But in the middle part there, you see that West Africa, um, uh, Central Africa, and East Africa has also come back to positive growth. If I highlight Eastern Africa region, because this is the only region on the continent that actually did not see a, uh, a contraction in uh, 2020 because of COVID. And this is also due to several aspects of their economic policies and reform agendas that we all have been working with them on. North Africa has rebounded very significantly, up to 11.7%, but we're going to see a, contra a, 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 a slowdown as well. But again, we looked at the structures of the economy, whether it's oil exporters, non-oil exporters, resource-intensive countries, and non-resource-intensive countries, and the patterns of the impact of that global headwind we all saw in 2020, and the recovery paths are also different, as you can see on that, uh, on that slide, due to several issues. But if we look at the macroeconomic fundamentals, there are two things that I would like to highlight, and this is something we all work on. One is the debt uh, vulnerabilities on the continent, which I have to say was not caused by COVID, but just exacerbated by COVID. So there are several structural issues on the continent, governance issues on the continent, that has meant that Africa's uh, economies are always depending on fiscal deficits in terms of moving forward. But also global financing architecture issues that also exacerbates that challenge. So, but I'm not going to go too much into debt, into the discussion on debt, because that's not the main sub subject of today. But the other side then is the consumer price inflation, especially of worry in many African countries are imported inflation, which again, we all know in this room what creates such uh, uh, scenarios for the continent. So to finance recovery from uh, COVID-19 and poverty reduction to meet poverty, pre-COVID poverty reduction targets, you see on this slide, it's going to cost Africa about 432 billion in just three years, between for, uh, 2020 and, um, and 2022. Uh, and it will, it will take the continent up to a decade to recover back to pre-COVID scenario. So it's quite grim, as uh, um, um, uh, my brother has already mentioned. And the number of people being dragged into uh, extreme poverty is quite um, sobering. We have up to 30, almost 30 uh, million people every year because of these challenges that we've seen. But one fundamental and systemic issue that has been there and remains there as a, an existential threat for Africa is the issue of climate change. So climate resilience and just energy transition becomes a very central issue that this report tried to look at. So we try to look at climate vulnerability indicators, climate readiness index, and also climate resilience across the different countries and different regions on the continent, but also comparing with the rest of the regions of the world. And on, in terms of climate vulnerability, Africa comes second to, uh, to South Asia. 
But for all the other indicators, Africa is actually last in its par, and, and at par with other countries. In terms of climate readiness, Africa ranks last. The climate vulnerability, Africa is also the most climate vulnerable on the continent. Again, because of the structures of the economy, the levels of development, and access to technology, access to finance, access to knowledge, and so many other things that are there. We will try to delve deeper into what's going on within the region with regard to this vulnerability. And we find also that the more fragile countries on the continent are the most vulnerable to climate change. And that sends a big signal in terms of the type of financing that we might be considering for these countries, because the more fragile countries do not have access to um, the non-concessional uh, financing windows in many of our financing architecture. So that raises another um, a big alarm for me with regard to how these countries are going to be able to address all these challenges. Then we try to look at the impacts of climate change on socioeconomic indicators. Between 20, uh, 2016 and 20, 2019, we had data for Africa lost 5 to 10 percent of GDP per capita growth because of climate change and extreme events. And this is in addition to increased mortality, uh, displacements, and so many things that are going on on the continent that's not really bode well for growth and sustainability uh, as we would all like to see. So the benefits of, and co-benefits of really investing massively on addressing climate change is huge. So, but the cost of doing that is also huge. So how do we merge that co-benefits to the global community and also the cost to the national states in terms of trying to address this challenge? One other thing that jumped out for us in the analysis is the strong correlation between per capita electricity consumption and GDP per capita. And if you consider this on the backdrop of the fact that Africa has very limited level of access to electricity with only 550 kilowatt hour in most in across the continent on average. But if you look at those fragile countries I talked about, it's actually 250 kilowatt hour that they have access to. So over 600 million Africans do not have access to electricity. And even those who do have the regularity, the reliability, and pricing of that power sources is a big drag for industrialization for, and small scale industries on the continent. So we try to look at, OK, what's going on with regard to the whole discussion about Paris Agreement and energy transitions within the climate agenda. Having been part of the discussions for the Paris Agreement and also the IPCC report, then I find a lot of um, some kind of uh, misalignments with the way we are discussing these issues. First, transition takes time. And as you can see in the energy mix of all the regions of the world, Africa, China, European Union, India, and United States, decoupling economies from the use of coal has always taken significant amount of time. Um, by every region. And actually, Africa is doing very well with regard to that transition. That's one point. Then the second point that came out in that analysis is the role of natural gas. All countries that have access to natural gas have always used this as a transition fuel to be able to reduce the use of higher uh, polluting, high carbon energy sources for generating electricity required for economic activity and growth. Then another point that came out, there is that green line on top the, that we have all talked so much about, which is the share of renewable energy in the energy mix of the countries around the world. I think it's only Europe that is, has been able to achieve up to 13% on average. So the, the share of renewable energy technologies in powering economic activities is still very low. And Africa is also doing very well in terms of that transition um, to, to, to this. But then when you consider then the contributions of the different regions of the world to existing uh, carbon emissions, historical carbon emissions, current carbon emissions, and future carbon emissions to be able to achieve the, the Paris Climate Agreement, then we came up with this concept of carbon, um, I mean, carbon credits and carbon debt of the world, uh, just using the whole concept of a carbon budget of the world. So we try to have some optimization to see what would it take with, for countries 
um, what headrooms do different countries have to be able to continue to grow the economy while remaining below the carbon budget of the world? And what we found was that several countries have already exceeded their carbon budget by significant amounts, while some, some countries, especially the least developed countries for obvious reasons, are still below their carbon budget. In terms of Africa, the uh, per capita ca carbon consumption is at 0.95 uh, 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 CO2 equivalent. But for the United States where I am, it's 40, uh, around 14 uh, uh, CO2 uh, tons per equi uh, equivalent. So if you consider that and also the uh, optimal use of carbon per capita, which is calculated as about two tons, Africa still has headroom to grow its economies. But if you try to use the social cost of carbon to quantify this uh, carbon debt and carbon credit of the world, what we found is that 85% of the global carbon budget are already used up, over 70% of it by the advanced economies. And then the average carbon footprint, like I've said for Africa, is 0.95, but for some other countries, it's up to 14. It varies depend, depending on the levels of development. And one thing we're still looking at is that this high carbon budget per capita is very highly correlated to the levels of the size of GDP growth in these countries. So basically what this is telling me is that by trying to stop uh, countries from using, uh, emitting carbon, you are, it's equivalent to like saying stop growth. If we don't come up with technologies that create fast decoupling, from growing GDP and growing CO2 emissions, then if you are telling the developing countries not to use gas, not to use coal, not to use this and that, it's simply like telling a policymaker, stop growing your economy so that will sustain the global community, uh, the global planet. So we try to see how we can then create trade-offs here. And then what we find is that uh, for Africa, Africa still has a carbon, has a carbon credit eval valued at the social, current social cost of carbon that's worth up to 4.8 trillion US dollars. So when you would try to look at that and juxtapose it with the need for growing economies and the huge opportunities that Africa has in the renewable energy options, in distributed energy options, we have several aspects here we have. Africa has huge comparative advantages to lead the world in these new green transitions, but it lacks the capital to do so. And this is where the issue about financing comes in. So on financing climate change and climate uh, uh, resilience, the thing we found that was a bit befuddling to me is that climate finance structuring is very complicated and creates misallocation of resources so that the intention of climate finance to support countries for climate adaptation, especially countries that are more vulnerable to climate change, is not happening. So the countries that are receiving climate finance now are the less vulnerable countries, and I'm talking of in Africa. But if you look at the global landscape, you find the same kind of pattern. So the purpose, the policy goal of climate finance is not being achieved. So climate finance flow then is misaligned with climate vulnerability and so on. So, and then I started, we looked at what will it cost Africa to meet the climate agreement reached in, in, at COP27. And one of the clear indicators is the cost of the nationally determined contributions. And from our calculations, it will cost Africa about 1.3 trillion to, at the lower bound, to 1.6 trillion between 2020 to 2030 to meet the NDCs. And let's keep in mind that the NDCs were agreed on the promise that climate finance flows were going to augment national uh, financing to address climate change, up to 80%. So if I use that 80% out of 1.6, then the, the continent will be expecting about 1.28 trillion US dollars to support its efforts to, uh, to, to transition for the global good of, the, of global sustainability. But on average, we are still receiving just about 1.8 billion annually. And this 1.8 billion includes financing from MDBs to which African governments are also shareholders. So again, there is some issues about double counting um, in terms of the definition of what counts as a climate finance in that regard. So we calculate a climate financing gap that's up to 118, 108 billion US dollars for Africa alone 
annually up to 2030. And let's keep in mind the whole global community, the promise was to get climate financing 100 billion. And up till now, we have not even met that target. So the imperative from this analysis for me is the need for global sustainability, considering the fact that climate change is a global commons challenge. So it doesn't really matter how much Europe or America invests in their own borders. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions doesn't need visa. And so does the impact. So are the impacts of climate change. So just like COVID-19, if we have climate emissions anywhere, the whole world is in trouble. So it is in our common interest to bring coordination to solve this problem. We also need to build more regional value chains so that we reduce the carbon footprint of products, not just because of the, uh, the, the obstructions in global supply chains that we're seeing because of COVID and the geopolitical tensions, but it is sustainability imperative that we actually try to regionalize value chains and reduce the carbon footprints of products. Scaling investments in renewable energy uh, and other energy technologies that will drive growth in Africa and in the developing world without increasing our CO2 emissions, the concept of decoupling economic growth from environmental harm becomes imperative. And to do this, again, is a global commons challenge and financing should be thought about in a, at the global level. And this is why we particularly think of the IMF in terms of uh, thinking about a green SDR that can be provided to support climate resilience in climate vulnerable countries. Having seen that the current architecture of the climate, vi uh, climate finance is not really helping matters. Because even if you increase climate finance, they are not going to receive it for several factors that I can go into later. But also we need to invest in institutional capacity development for green transitions. It takes a different kind of adjust structural programs, governance programs, technologies, policies, and several things that needs to be done, different from what we have been doing since the 1940s in order to make this transition happen. It goes without saying, to restore confidence in the global resolve to address climate change, the 100 billion climate finance commitment needs to be met. And the discussion about what actually it costs, which I've given you for Africa is 1.6, trillion need also to be discussed so that we know exactly what it is that is required to address this challenge. Because climate change challenges cannot be addressed incrementally. If there is a cyclone, you can say you have addressed it pathway. <laughs> if you didn't create, address it holistically, you, still go, you are still going to have the economic damages that you would get even if you didn't address it at all. But we need to also advance innovation in financing instruments. There are several instruments that are already available, the green bonds, the, the carbon markets, the uh, you know, sustainability-linked uh, loans. There are several financing tools that are out there now. We just need to scale them and really see how we can use that to, to uh, drive growth and development concurrently while addressing the sustainability issues. But for Africa, and especially the most climate vulnerable countries, we need to increase concessional financing to support them because they can't have access to the non-concessional financing for the several reasons I've given you. Conclusions that I would, would draw from this is one, we need to keep in mind that climate change is a global commons problem. We cannot leave countries or any party to try and address it on their own because it doesn't matter what we do as advanced economies if the developing countries are not doing the same. We will still have the same problem. Energy systems, technology transitions need to be adequate, cost optimal, and viable. It's not um, politically uh, doable to ask a country in Africa, like the example you gave in Congo, to preserve the peatland so that it becomes a carbon uh, sequestration asset for the world so that uh, the citizens will die. So the only way to do that is to provide alternative financing to allow them to be able to access the technologies to provide the energy they need and the social services they need in order to keep economies going. So we need that kind of global social contract in order to move forward. Investing in this, uh, decentralized energy systems is key. I can't overemphasize it. But then let's keep in mind that climate finance, what Africa needs, is not part 
of 100 billion. What Africa needs is 1.6 trillion, if we really are serious to address the global uh, challenges that are there for all of us. And that's just one SDG. Let's remember that climate action is one out of 17 SDGs. To address poverty and, re and reverse economic harm of COVID alone, 432 billion. If you look at all the, all the other SDGs, the numbers are just humongous. Let me close with words of wise ones that has lived before us, Albert Einstein. In the middle of difficulties lies opportunities. So it might look grim, but what I see is opportunities for us to really do things differently and be able to steer growth in Africa to lead the green transitions that will benefit the world. We cannot use an old map to explore the new world. So it tells me the economics I've been doing is what leaves us where we are now. The policies I've been implementing is what leaves us where we are now. The conditionalities you guys have been giving us in Africa is also part of what leaves us here now. So we need to step back and think about how can we do these things differently so that we're not trying to use an old map to chart a new world. But that will include trade-offs. And if I quote Els Oyen from a Norwegian scholar, he also makes it very clear. To solve any social problem, or even reduce it in any way, there must be distribution or redistribution of economic, political, and social resources. That also includes redistribution of power. So we need to think about how do we work together as a global community to solve this global commons challenge so that we can save the world for ourselves, for our children, and for our next generations. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Arama. Um, I think really has got people thinking uh, and, and impressed on all of us um, how consequential these issues are. Um, so we'll turn next to James Rove from the Fiscal Affairs Department um, for some uh, reflections on the, on the issues. James, please. Sure, thanks very much. And, uh, and thank you uh, very much, Professor Romano, for this uh, presentation and for the report. I really enjoyed reading it, um, and it's a really important, um, important report. Um, you know, climate is clearly going to be um, critical, one of the most critical issues for, for Africa over the next uh, coming decades. Um, and uh, the report um, sets out very well, I think, the, the challenges and issues that you have going forward. I think from the point of view of the fund, um, you know, maybe we would, would have different estimates of some of the analytical details, um, of course, as if everybody would. But the messages and the recommendations, the policy recommendations that you're making in, in, in the report, I think are uh, powerful and, and inescapable and, and ones that we, um, we really agree with. Um, so I, I was going to just speak a little bit about some of the ones, um, the, these messages that um, really resonated with me when I was, I was reading it um, in, in the areas of adaptation, uh, mitigation, and then uh, on this important issue of climate finance that you, uh, you, you, you um, put, put at the center of this. Um, so on, on adaptation, I think, um, you know, this is the biggest issue um, really for, for Africa. This is um, climate change is happening. Um, climate change is um, going to affect uh, African countries probably more than any other region. Um, it's already hot, it's already dry in lots of countries. Um, the uh, economy is exposed to more climate sensitive sectors than uh, lots, of, lots of other countries. And um, incomes are lower, and this is um, you know, absolutely a central part of it because um, richer countries you know, do have uh, much more capacity to adapt and to uh, uh, d d much more resilience to climate change. So that's, that's where I want to come to the message that comes out from the report um, about the importance of looking at this holistically um, across all of the SDGs that you mentioned, because I think the report says, you know, it, it's um, the, you need integrated sustainable development pathways and avoiding silos um, that, that, put on, that focus on one dimension uh, over another. And you know, for us, we've done some work recently on adaptation, uh, fiscal policies for adaptation in the fund. 
And one of the key messages that came out of that was that this is part of development, adaptation and development. They're like two sides of the same, same coin. That uh, you, you, you know, often adaptation policies might be the best way to uh, pursue development, but equally often development policies that may be nothing to do with climate, like health and education, may be the best way to develop capacity to, um, to have a more resilient economy. So I think that's really important to, to think going forward. I think it's a message coming out from the report. Uh, and I think it's, it's something that we need to bear in mind in, in thinking about um, our attitudes or strategies for, for climate, because we, you know, we absolutely don't want climate um, finance or climate um, policies to come at the expense of other uh, development priorities in these other SDGs. We need to look at them. We need to look at them all together. Um, on on mitigation, um, I think the the report really um, effectively makes the case that um, you know on on a, a historical equity or any other grounds, um, you know, Africa has huge capacity, huge, huge um, rights, if you like, to to um, emit more um, before. Uh, yeah, from, from, a, from an equity point of view, the numbers are so low that uh, both historical and current emissions per capita in Africa um, are, are extremely low. Um, but you know, just because you have a right to do something doesn't mean it's in your interest to do it. And I think that's a message that's coming, coming, coming out from the report as well. And I think from this point of view, you know, there, there's a few um, things to think about. First of all, uh, you know, even if the advanced countries stopped emitting altogether, the developing and emerging countries would be emitting so much over the next uh, few years, a few decades, that um, climate change is going is, is, is to get worse and worse. And uh, that's going to be, again, most affecting uh, the poorer countries. So there's a kind of self-interest that we, we have to solve this, this problem together. Um, there's the issue, I think, of um, co-benefits, which um, you know, we, we uh, often overlook, I think, is how much difference it makes for the health benefits of people in cities, particularly, um, from pursuing clean energy. So there's a, there's a sort of uh, local environmental benefit, which is often bigger, actually, than the, the um, global benefit when you think about uh, you know, how much improved health means to, uh, to people. In, in, even even just in, in economic terms. But I think that the, the most important thing, which again uh, I, I read in the report, is the opportunities that there are in the, um, in the green transition. That, that, that countries don't have to go through um, you know, the, 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 the same development path that the advanced countries went through. Um, and that there can be a lot of opportunity to go to get, have a much, uh, a much better development path using the technology um, that, that uh, is being developed. And, and this is where I think, you know, as you, you look back to the, the slides at the end, we need new ways of thinking. This is really the, 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 the thing that gives the most hope, I think, is to find a way through. Um, and, and that, again, is something that, that all of, uh, you know, the support for, for Africa needs to be f focused on that, um, and, and, and country policies need to be focused on making the most of these opportunities. But all of this said, I think, um, you know, I don't think anybody would say that Africa needs to cut its emissions from where they, where they are now. I think um, what we're talking about is um, a path where emissions will continue to grow in, in um, many countries um, around the world, many lower-income countries in Africa as well. Um, but the question is, will they grow as fast as they would without mitigation policies? But mitigation policies are about bending that curve down uh, and, and allowing growth to happen uh, while um, taking advantage of technology to reduce the, um, the, the, the uh, emissions per uh, per output, so that you get a, a path which is consistent with um, with globally um, reducing emissions to where we need them to get to. That means coming down on a much steeper path in emer in, in advanced countries, and this, as I say, in developing countries of, of 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 managing the curve and reducing them, so that we all end up in the right place uh, at the end. And I don't think mitigation co policies should be coming at the expense of growth. I mean, this is this is this is where we need to uh, in in all of this. We need to focus on growth, um, that's, as I said, extremely important for adaptation, but it's important for how we think about mitigation policies as well. Finally, on, on, um, on climate finance, again, I think the report amply makes the, uh, the moral, the um, equity uh, case for much more financing um, for, for climate. Um, I think that's a case which, of course, you know, has been made for many years in many different areas of development. That there should be much more, much more support. 
Are we going to see as much as um, is needed and is deserved? I, I don't think so. Um, I, I think that you know, we all need to push as hard as we can for that outcome. Um, but uh, he, here I wanted just to focus a little bit on what countries can do themselves. I think that's really important to think about what countries can do themselves to uh, maximize the climate finance uh, and, and to make the best, uh, best use of it. Um, and here I say a couple of things. Uh, one, is, one is on the, the importance of the private sector, on having policies in place that encourage private sector money uh, to come into the country and to be used in the most productive ways possible. I think um, on the mitigation side, for example, carbon pricing is, is very effective in that way, that it, it, it provides the right incentives for uh, profits to be made in renewables rather than in, in fossil fuels. Um, on the adaptation side, perhaps things like uh, reinforcing property rights um, and uh, strengthening regional uh, regional trade and, and this, the, these kind of uh, is issues can help uh, encourage the private money because for, in both adaptation and mitigation, most of the investment is, is going to be a private sector issue. Um, when it comes to the public sector, I think um, it's very important for countries to um, direct as much as possible and to, to have real sort of uh, control and agency over what's happening. We've seen that the uh, climate finance flows that come in so far have been um, focused too much on mitigation. I think that the sort of revealed preferences of the, of the donors um, is, on, is on mitigation. But adaptation is really, I think, the most important, as I said, the most important thing. We need to see that, that coming more that way. I think there's a lot that countries can do to attract more cl climate finance from the existing um, funds. Uh, we've done some work with uh, Asian countries and now also with African countries in how to un unlock and, and get hold of this finance, particularly for smaller countries that have have less capacity. It can be difficult to get, uh, you know, to to to, um, to to jump through all the hoops and hurdles to um, to get that that climate finance. So, so I think that is that is very important as well. Um, and the other area I wanted to mention was public financial management. Again, this is this is in the report, of course, um, but it is extremely important for countries to develop and and. Uh, and build their um, public financial management systems to make sure that the use of fund funding that they're getting uh, is maximized and that we can, uh, we can, we can uh, see uh, these choices being made in a really um, developmental way. Where is the best developmental use of, this, of this, uh, the, fund, the funding that's, that's available? Um, finally, I can't talk about climate finance without mentioning what the IMF is, is doing in this area, which is you know, trying to uh, contribute our part to this. Um, and of course, there's the Resilience and Sustainability Trust, which is just being put together now. We're piloting it uh, in, in a number of countries, including some in Africa. Uh, and that is uh, intended to make, uh, the, the fund is, I think, aimed to be over $45 billion. Uh, um, dollars, um, and it's on very concessional terms, which is important. You talked about the importance of the concessionality in this um, for Certainly, for you know, by the standards of the IMF, this is extremely, extremely um, concessional money with 20 years grace, uh, 20 years um, repayment period, and, and 10 years grace. So we're really hoping that this will make a difference as, as part of what the world needs to do, as you as you so rightly say, to to uh, increase the um, the climate finance to, to countries. So I'll stop there, and thank you very much. Yeah. Thank thank you so much, James. Um, so for people here in the room or on our virtual audience, I think we have a lot of people um, watching online. Um, please, if you have questions or, or comments, um, you know, here in the room, uh, step up and, and online send in. But maybe before opening up to questions, uh, Professor Yorama and your, your colleague, um, if there are any points from, from James's intervention that you'd like to, to react to, um, the link, the, the focus on adaptation and development um, and, and the discussion on the mitigation side um, of the agreement that this is about growth and you know, mitigation that is then uh, reducing emissions path um, over and above what would have been there um, and so that that still would be uh, a goal for, for Africa, but how, how do you do that um, in a way that still includes and encourages growth? Uh, and then, and then the, the points about, about climate finance, uh, agreeing with the need for, for ambition um, and particular 
suggestions then about what African countries themselves can do. So any, if, if you wanted to react to any of those points and then um, people in the room and online. Uh, and uh, Abe, did you want to? Mr. Mr. Okay. Um, so um, okay. should we let Mr. Yeah, maybe we take um, uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Simpasa's intervention, and then we can respond to both together. Sounds good. <coughs> Mr. Simpasa, please. Thank you, Kathy, and uh, thanks, Kevin, but also thanks to the fund for inviting us to this seminar and thanks to James also for these very useful interventions. Uh, just quick points for me uh, on the presentation really and just to argument what uh, Kevin had, had, had put across. Uh, one is on the, uh, the challenges that the countries are really facing and we see that with the Russian-Ukraine uh, conflict we likely to see additional uh, challenges especially on the poverty front uh, but also on the unemployment uh, levels. We expect at least about 1.3 million more people to be out of jobs by the end of this year and next. Uh, that, of course, uh, presupposes that the, the conflict ends now, but as we have seen, uh, there is still some uh, challenges in resolving this conflict. Uh, the second point that uh, I would like to speak to uh, is uh, what we are now seeing in the advanced economies. Uh, we see increase in interest rates. Uh, just last week, the European Union, the European Central Bank increased their uh, policy rate uh, much higher than what was expected. And this is having uh, significant implications for many countries in Africa uh, that had seen an increase in inflows of their capital. Uh, with uh, capital outflows expected out of uh, these changes in the advanced economies monetary policy, uh, we're likely to see uh, capital flow out of the continent, or at least not flow as, as, at, at the same pace that we have, uh, we have been seeing prior to the pandemic. Uh, and that, of course, will have implications for exit rates and what uh, that means is that inflation could be much higher than what we are projecting in the report. Uh, so there is a need really for central banks as well as fiscal authorities to coordinate their policy responses to ensure that uh, we do not get uh, into a situation where growth will stall uh, at the uh, uh, wellest inflation is spiraling out of control, as we are seeing in the advanced economies. The third point, and uh, this relates to the financing of climate change, really. Uh, we, 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 we hammering on the need for uh, the global community to honor their commitments on the 100 billion uh, that they have made uh, to developing countries, uh, to, the, to the world more generally. I think when we look at this in comparative to the resources that were mobilized to support the COVID-19 pandemic, I think you, 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 you get a sense that resources really are not a problem. Uh, what is lacking is commitment. And uh, if, if we saw the same level of commitment that we saw uh, countries roll out their, uh, their support, their response to the COVID-19, where at most $17 trillion was raised in various interventions, uh, then $100 billion becomes really very, very small. Uh, in that respect. Uh, so we, we, we just hope that the, uh, some of the issues that we have highlighted in this report uh, will be taken up, but we need uh, a global collision really to be able to uh, take this matter very, very seriously. And I think that uh, the trust fund that the fund has put out uh, combined with other interventions could catalyze additional green finance uh, that will support the adaptation measures that African countries need to be able to weather the uh, effects of this climate change that we see now having its effects uh, not only on the continent but elsewhere as well. So I just thought that I should add my voice to what already has been said and we look forward to further questions and we'll be able to respond. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Tony, for that uh, addition. And thank you so much for a very um, comprehensive discussion of the, of the report. First, um, <clears throat> let me speak briefly on uh, the, the issue you raised about donors 
revealed preference for mitigation. Um, it's, it's, uh, you see that in Africa and everywhere, the climate finance flows, the little trickles that comes in, comes in for mitigation. But what countries really need in Africa is adaptation. Because when you are trying to focus on mitigation for a country or a continent that is really not emitting uh, CO2 emissions, so that really already defines why the climate f finance flows is low. Because the objective is to mitigate. And if the objective is to mitigate and you are still way below your per capita footprint, then there's no incentive for that financing to come towards you. And if we are focusing on mitigation and not focusing on the adaptation needs of the countries, we need to keep in mind the knock-on effects on other sustainable development goals and how the poverty itself engenders emissions on the continent. The work we've done on the IPCC, what we find is that in Africa, that little 3% that we're seeing is coming from um, agriculture, forestry, and land use systems. And these are just due to poor use of technologies in farming, cutting down forests to cook food, and, and um, uh, land use systems in terms of, if you think about transport sector in Africa, if you've been to Abidjan where I live and you drive on the streets in the, in the, this, in the, uh, during the rush hour, nobody will talk to you about carbon emissions because you see it happening. Because the cars that are driving on the roads are like 30 years old, the efficiency of the conversion of that fuel to the locomotion that you need is very low. So the, the, the poor person is spending more per unit of, for per mileage traveled, is emitting more CO2 per mileage traveled, and it's also creating huge health problems because of the carbon monoxide pollution that that creates. So it's a lose-lose for everybody. So poverty engenders environmental degradation, including CO2 emissions. So in some work we've done, we find that if you replaced the cooking systems in households in Africa with uh, coal-powered hot tubs, yeah, you reduce CO2 emissions in Africa in, from household emissions by about 80%. Reason is you stop the cutting down of forests, you create more efficiency in cooking food, and all those things. And it also save lives because over 600,000 Africans die annually because of indoor air pollution. So for me, the message to donors would be, let's not prioritize what we want. Let's prioritize what is needed to solve the problem that we are investing our resources to, to doing. Now, you talked about uh, fundamental issues about how to fast track the the decoupling of CO2 emissions and environmental harm. For me, that's the way forward. And that is what the, that's what transitions mean. You transition from what you've been doing in order to do something better. But that doesn't mean to stop doing what you're doing. It means change the course of the direction of travel. So that instead of having this perfect correlation that I've shown you, you start seeing it going this way. And the work we've done with uh, the International Resources Panel, we find that every country in the world, the transitioning from environmental harm to is, is, is because of factor productivity and higher efficiency in production, higher efficiency in con consumption. So if we don't focus on those economic principles of increasing the marginal returns to the use of resources, we will use more coal, we use more gas, we use more energy to achieve less economic output. And that is just not optimal for anyone. So that focus on transition, instead of asking countries to stop what they're doing, should be the best way forward. And it's a win-win for everyone. All the other points you have raised, I couldn't agree more. So there's no need to comment um, on it anymore on, on that. But on financing, let me emphasize the point that Anthony raised. We need to keep in mind that climate change is what I call a planetary pandemic. This pandemic is not killing one person at a time. It can wipe out the whole planet when it happens. And if you doubt me, go to see where cyclones has happened. 
anything in the way is wiped out. So if we are now, today I just traveled from uh, a meeting in Philadelphia and all the plane, trains were delayed. That's economic productivity losses. Why? Heat waves. What's causing it? Higher temperatures. That's what we're trying to solve here. So we cannot be uh, squamish about economic, um, about resources, because solving climate change challenges will help to improve economic productivity for everyone. So if we were able to do it for, for, uh, for the other health pandemic, for COVID-19, over 17 trillion in 18 months, and impressively the world came together and solved the problem, and we can still be here now. Um, I believe that the world, when there is political will, we have the policy tools, we have the instruments, we have the resources to solve the problem, especially the private sector that you raised. How many trillions are sitting there looking for negative returns? Why can't we put it on growing economies, getting higher rates of return in that growth of the economies, but also serving the global good of saving the planet? Thank you so much, uh, Professor Rama. Um, so I was going to follow up on this private finance point. Um, and if there's anything more that you wanted to say about what the African Development Bank is doing um, in the area of um, encouraging private finance for, for climate, that would be welcome. Um, we had a question from um, online uh, relating to the important role of domestic capacity and institutions to deal with uh, climate change. Um, and the question is, again, um, you, you started by showing for African countries how low the institutional capacity for resilience is. So again, what can institutions like yours and ours do uh, to help strengthen that institutional capacity for uh, resilience and adaptation? OK, thank you very much. Let me start from the institutions one. Those who know me, you know that this is really a passion for me, because institutions define everything, um, defines the factors of production, it defines efficiency, it defines almost everything. Basically, it provides the rules of the game on how economies function. And institutional capacity in Africa is very low. And that's why the African Development Bank Group has developed two main strategies, which we discussed when we were talking about partnerships uh, uh, two days ago, uh, with regard to uh, 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 strengthening institutional capacity on the continent. So we have a capacity development strategy, and we also have a, uh, a strategy for economic governance in Africa. These two strategic uh, frameworks provides for us as a bank the key instruments that we'll be using in terms of helping countries to show up their capacity for development. Because when we try to baptize things, we say, you know, capacity for adaptation. Thank you for raising the point. Doing adaptation anywhere is just about doing development. But you're doing development in a climate resilient way. So instead of uh, uh, building uh, facilities that cannot resist uh, earthquakes in an earthquake prone zone, it doesn't make any economic sense to do that. So it doesn't make any economic sense for anyone to invest in non-resilient infrastructure these days. So that's why in the African Development Bank Group, over 40% of our target is that over 40% of our financing for development will be climate proofed. And we have exceeded that now uh, in many ways. Now, the other strategy that I need to talk about, because you raised it uh, when you were discussing the report, is the Public Financial Management Academy for Africa, which thanks to the fund for all the work <coughs> we have been doing together on this, Cathy especially, and all your teams for all the work that you've been doing with us on this, because the resources we are receiving are smaller and smaller, and the needs are bigger and bigger. So it makes very clear sense that we need to improve transparency, we need to improve accountability, we need to improve governance systems to ensure that every dollar invested reaches more in terms of delivering the development outcomes that we are all very much interested in. 
So supporting institutions, supporting uh, public financial management, and all these ways of building capacity for countries to do development better is climate friendly. Thank you. Yeah, I think. That's uh, the point there. Please. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rama, for your eloquent presentation, and uh, to Mr. Simfasa and to my friend James. So you, you laid out uh, very well the vulnerabilities in Africa as far as climate is concerned. You also spoke about the needs for climate financing. So in a couple of days, I'm from the Monetary and Capital Markets Department. In a couple of days, we are publishing a paper on mobilizing climate financing, where we are talking about the constraints for pl private financing and also coming out with possible solutions. So there's one thing, as we were looking at, Professor Sim, uh, Mr. Simfasa mentioned that there's a lot of money out there, and it's, it's, uh, that it's not coming and it needs to be attracted. Yes, one important thing is that you need, a good, you, you need good projects, you need some portfolio of projects so that money can come in. But even so, when you look at the private financing, there are many investors who do not get into more than a handful of emerging and developing market economies because there are huge market frictions in terms of benchmark returns that they want, exchange rate depreciations, there are governance issues, so many issues that, that uh, uh, you know, hamper private financing from coming into it. So we are exploring solutions where there is public private risk sharing in terms of market structure and strengthen role for multilateral development banks where there could be uh, first loss guarantees for some to some extent which needs to be priced in but also there are things that where multilateral development banks can change the way in which they are investing by coming in and putting in more money into equity so that then they can leverage many times private financing because private finance is not going to come in un unless the public sector or the multilateral development banks also bring in equity into the projects. But by bringing equity, you can easily re reap all the social benefits and the so uh, of uh, uh, any of the carbon, uh, as you also mentioned, the carbon uh, uh, retiring of carbon projects. Mm -hmm. So how do you think that multilateral development banks should change the way in which they are doing business, especially for climate, so that they can focus more on equity, less on debt or different market structures so that they can bring in uh, private uh, financing and scale it up. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very, <laughs> very, very important question. And it dovetails to what I was saying in the presentation that we cannot use the old map to chart the new world. For me, the Bretton Woods institutions that were established in the 40s to address these things, we really need a fundamental rethinking of how we engage. And that includes those innovative um, uh, ways of leveraging capital um, in the private sector to scale investments not only in the energy, in the, in the, for, for climate investments, but for me, in, even in all the infrastructure areas that we are investing. Because from what you've seen in the report, that's not really happening now. And if you look at the success rates, for me, success rates is about development happening in countries, and success rates is about achieving the goals that we, the reason deter for establishing these institutions, poverty alleviation and the rest of it. But we're still not catching up with, uh, I mean, of course, lots of millions of people have been pulled out of poverty, but millions more have been born and are in poverty. So if you look at it in absolute terms, we're really not moving forward. So that thinking differently, like uh, I would look forward to the report you are talking about, because we need a lot more of such innovative financing systems. But it sometimes may require that we rethink the fundamental rules that uh, it's established us as MDBs. The original thinking 
the, to address the challenges that were there in, when it was established. The world has moved on, and there has been a lot of evolutions. And we really need to think very fundamentally about how we engage with countries in, uh, in trying to address uh, such uh, issues that you are raising. Because for me, you find that we have trillions of dollars looking for negative returns. And you have areas where you have high returns potentials, but then perceptions of risks and sometimes ratings of risk, which there are a lot of questions about the independence of how that is done, um, affects the flow of capital. So capital is flowing in reverse direction uh, in many ways, not going to where it even ends more uh, for the investors. It's really difficult to understand. But this is something that has now a legacy that we have carried for many years. But I think what we need to do now is to sit down and have a fundamental rethinking on how the global financial architecture supports the flow of capital to the areas of need so that we can achieve the global goals that we have set, the SDGs, um, the, the, the Climate Agreement, Biodiversity Convention. There are several goals that we agree. But when you look at the infrastructure that we have in place to support flow of capital, to support uh, to achieve those goals, then they are really misaligned. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, okay, Preetha. Hi, thank you very much for the great presentation and for working on this topic, which is very much needed at this moment in time. Um, one question we have is on carbon credits, because that's a potential way of raising financing. Um, how is the AFDB supporting this, the carbon credit trade specifically, and the correct pricing of credits in the region? Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. That's also a trillion dollar question. Um, because again, for me, the carbon market idea is a brilliant idea um, on how to actually help in, in, in mobilizing resources to do what we're, we're talking about. But it's totally underpriced. The current social carbon, uh, carbon price is very low. And in many ways, for me, it doesn't actually look to lead, lead to the behavioral changes we're expecting um, in the market. Uh, it's actually also regressive to the poor. Because the pricing now, it, it encourages, it encourages <laughs> carbon dumping, if I have to use that, such a word, <laughs> yeah, by those who, who can pay the little amounts that is, uh, is required. So what we're doing, uh, we have uh, a, a financing facility that brings together the private sector. It's called AFAC. It, call, it brings together the private sector and the public sector to really have discussions on how to uh, these these uh, markets can evolve on the continent, um, but that work has uh, is is still just like the carbon markets itself is still at young um, um, uh, uh, beginning stages. So not so much. Basically, all of us, including the IMF, we could do a lot more in that area. You can just imagine what it would mean for Congo, for example, if the the carbon sequestration. Um, uh, services of the peatlands in Congo is fully capitalized. They will not need to be saying what we heard in the beginning, that they, they have to just harness their, their gas because it's cheaper, because they will have a lot of resources to be able to develop all the other uh, renewable energy options, which they also have in abundance. Um, that country, for example, has the most deposits of uh, development, green development minerals. So the, that's why, for me, the, the main fundamental thing, and speaking at the, world, uh, the IMF, uh, the main fundamental thing is how do we innovatively make concessional financing available to these countries so that they can make the transition we are all talking about. What I find in global conventions, well, this is, by November, we'll have the 27th. <laughs> conference of parties. That's 27 years of discussion on something. That really is it's really difficult for me to understand. Something as urgent and as important as climate change, we've been discussing for 27 years. So maybe because the impacts of climate change was gradual, but now it's no longer gradual. <laughs> it's no longer, when I started working on this subject, 
we used to refer to climate risks as uh, low probability, high risk events. But now it's a high probability, high risk event. So it's impacting on the, on the bottom line of companies everywhere. I can imagine how much Amtrak will be losing just this week, just in delays. So we really need to realize that times have changed and we need to, the models we have been using has served us so well, but maybe we need to discuss how to tweak it, how to change it, and that includes, if I'm bold to say that, um, the fundamentals, the articles of an of organization, of even the IMF, the African Development Bank, all of us, we really need to think more so that we become relevant today to the development challenges of today instead of the development challenges of yesterday. So thank you so much. Um, I think we are, we are getting to our closing time, but I think that's a, a really powerful way to, to end, both on the opportunities that are there for the region um, with the transition, uh, given the wealth of resources that could be there for um, renewables and particularly then the minerals that are really important globally for this transition. And how do we support countries to be able to uh, take uh, advantage of those opportunities? That point of yours. And then your other point um, about the issue is no longer in the future. The issue is now. <laughs> And uh, so there's, there's not time to waste with continued discussions year after year. Um, we all have to, to, have to act now. And so I'd just like to ask everyone here and online uh, to join me in just thanking uh, Professor Yorama, his colleague, uh, Mr. Simpasa, and, and James Rowe for joining us um, for a really, really interesting and important discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for hosting us. Uh, we treasure these partnerships, and let's continue to do more of this. Thank you. Thank you.